but I'm talking about the power which comes from on high. The power of the Holy Spirit. You need this power in your life. The power that can heal. The power that can change things. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, 704 Church. It's always such a, an honor and a privilege to have the opportunity to speak God's word, to teach, to be a part of the fellowship. Honestly, I feel like I could uh, go home right now. You know, the worship, the word that's already been given um, has just blessed my heart. The testimonies of God moving and doing things in the lives of his people. Um, I think, I forget who just said it, maybe it was Pastor E. God is real and, and God is at work. And so um, I'm, I just feel blessed and so fortunate and happy to be able to, to share with you guys this morning. So you guys know we've been in the book of Luke and we're in the, the fifth chapter this morning. Pastor Thaddeus went through verses 1 through 11 of uh, chapter 5. And uh, this morning, I'm going to pick up at verse 12, and we're going to go through verse 26. So in keeping with tradition, let me invite everyone to... Bring out the book! <laughs> That's right, bring out the book. Whether you've got an old school one like this one, or you, it's your cell phone, or however you're doing it, it's the Word of God, right? And that's what we need in our lives this morning. And so um, we're in Luke chapter 5, but... Um, before we get into chapter 5, I just wanted to spend a, a few minutes and maybe lay a little bit of a predicate here for the heart of the message. And the predicate for the message really begins in chapter 3 of the book of Luke. And there are a couple of things in chapter 3 that I want to just point out and I want you to make a note of. Just jot it down if you take notes or jot it down in your Bible somewhere. Because in chapter 3, we're introduced to John, right? John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin. And John is the forerunner of the Messiah. And John is in the wilderness. And John is crying out. And he's saying, prepare the way for the Lord. Prepare the way, Israel. Turn back from the direction that you are going in, which is really repentance, is when you're going in one direction. And then you turn 180 degrees and walk back toward God. And so here is John who's crying out, prepare the way for the Lord. But really what he's saying is what we've been singing all morning is prepare your hearts for the Lord. Prepare your heart for the Lord. Prepare your hearts. And we see in chapter 3 the depiction of the Holy Trinity, right? Jesus submits to John, is baptized and when Jesus is baptized, we see the Holy Spirit descends and anoints his baptism. And the Father in heaven speaks audibly and says, this is my son in who I am well pleased. And so we see that preparation. And then in chapter 4, in the book of Luke, Jesus is led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit, where he's tempted by the devil. And he's tempted with his belly, with his flesh, right? You're hungry, so turn these rocks into bread and, and eat. Satisfy yourself. He's tempted with power. Satan says, I can give you all of these kingdoms. Just look down. They were given to me, and I can give them to you. And let me just say something about that. The New Testament says that Satan is the small g God of this world. And so some of these battles that we're fighting, some of these people who you think are against you, some of these organizations that are doing evil, there is a spiritual force that's behind them. We're in a spiritual battle. It's not just the person you see that's opposing you. There's a spiritual force that's behind it. There's a satanic force at work in the world today. And we have to know that. Because we need the Lord to fight those battles for us. Amen? Amen? Amen. And so he's tempted with this power. And he's also tempted with pride. You know, throw yourself down. Of course, the angels will come and rescue you. But if you notice that each time that temptation came to Jesus, he responded only in one way. 
He did the same thing each time. He brought out the book. Now, he didn't have a Torah on him, it says in the script, right? He didn't have a scroll that he pulled out. But the word, he in fact was the living word. (laughs) The word was written on his heart. The word was in his mind. And friends, that's a message for you and me. That we've got to have that word in our hearts. We've got to have that word emblazoned in our minds so that we can push back in those times of temptation. So, Jesus returned to Galilee after that encounter. The Bible says, in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he began teaching in the synagogues. He was empowered by the Spirit, anointed, empowered, and then he began to teach in the synagogues. And he said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, and he's anointed me to bring this message, this this good news of release of the captives. You no longer have to be slaves of sin. Liberty, the year of God's favor. God's favor is upon you, Israel. This is the good news of the kingdom. That as we repent, we can have that relationship with God. The restoration that you've been waiting for is here, right in your midst. I'm fulfilling prophecy right in front of your eyes. But Jesus doesn't just say it, right? You can say a bunch of things. He backs it up. He immediately begins to back it up. And by the time we get to chapter 5, where our message will be today, as Luke tells the story, this is where the first disciples are officially called, right? Jesus tells them, gentlemen, I'm not building you a fishing empire, which is probably what some of them thought with that huge haul of fish that Pastor Thaddeus talked about in verses 1 through 11 last week. They probably thought, gee, this is going to be amazing. With Jesus on our side, we could have a haul of fish like this every weekend. But Jesus says, no, I'm going to teach you. And he's teaching you and me how to catch men. How to catch men and women. That's the goal. Jim Elliott, who was a missionary, said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I'm going to teach you to catch men. I'm going to teach you to catch men and women who are lost and who need to return to the Father. The book of Proverbs, chapter 11 and 30, says, The fruit of the righteous, those who are in Christ, is a tree of life. And he who wins souls is wise. So are we winning souls? Are we catching men? Are we catching women? What are we doing with our time? And I want you to see this because what I'm going to get at this morning is really the heart of this message. Because by the time Jesus leaves that lake, after that miracle occurs, there's a transition. There's the beginning of his ministry where there's the announcement by John, prepare your hearts. There's the anointing by John in baptism, right? But there's also the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the audible voice of the Father. Then there's a a leading by the Spirit. Where Jesus is tempted, responds with the word. And then there's a leaning where he leans into the word of God. It is written, he says. And then there's the lesson where he moves in the power of the Holy Spirit and into ministry. Now, look what happens right after Jesus calls these disciples into ministry. And it begins at verse 12. So I'm going to read from my translation. Hopefully, they're putting it up on the screen in back of me there. 
But starting at verse 12, this is right after the miracle of the, of the fish. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a small man was there who had leprosy all over him. And he saw Jesus. He fell face down and he begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. So reaching out his hand, Jesus touched him saying, I'm writing. I am willing. Be made clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then he ordered him, tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer what Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. But the news about him spread even more. And large crowds would come together to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. So after this, Jesus is out. He is walking in the anointing. He is healing people. Large crowds are coming. But what does Jesus do? In verse 16, it says, Yet he often withdrew to deserted places and prayed. The crowds were coming. People were being healed. People were being set free. Ministry was being done. Yet Jesus often withdrew. He went by himself to a deserted place and he prayed. The Holy Spirit had come upon him. He had been anointed. He'd been baptized by John. But apparently that wasn't enough. Apparently he needed to get back alone with God often in a place where he could commune with God, where he could get into the heart of worship, where he could sit at Jesus, at the Father's feet. So he would withdraw and he would pray. So as the scripture goes on, on one of those days, while he was teaching, Pharisees and the teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and also from Jerusalem. And the Lord's power to heal was in him. <laughs> his power to heal was in him. His readiness, his willingness, his ability to heal was present. It was right there. Like some of you may know the story of when he was walking through the town and the woman who had the issue of blood and she wanted healing. The power to heal was in him. She said, if I can only reach out and touch his garment, I'll be healed. So the Lord's power to heal was in him. It was present. But here's what's going on. Just then, some men came carrying on a stretcher a man who was paralyzed. And they tried to bring him in and set him down before Jesus, but the place was crowded. So since they could not find a way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof, lowered him on a stretcher, through the roof tiles, and into the middle of the crowd before Jesus. Now that's desperation. And seeing their faith, Jesus said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. But the, the scribes and the, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, they had a problem with this. So they began to think to themselves, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? How can he forgive sins or who can forgive sins but, but God alone? But perceiving their thoughts, Jesus replied to them, why are you thinking this in your hearts? Right? Why are you thinking this in your hearts? Had not John come and exhorted you to prepare your hearts? Am I not here, the embodiment of what you've been praying for for centuries, walking among you? So why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier for me to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. But just so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority, and there's that word again, on earth to forgive sins. He told the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your stretcher, and go home. And immediately he got up before them, picked up what he had been lying on, 
and went home glorifying God. Now, let me ask you something. Isn't that the goal? You know, some, somehow we lose the goal along the way. That regardless of what their opinions were about what was transpiring in front of them, the man got healed and he got up and he glorified God. And everyone else was astounded by it, and they were giving glory to God as well. So the place broke out in revival. People were just glorifying God. And here are these teachers of the law, and they're sitting there, and they're having a problem with this. They're criticizing it in their hearts. And the people were filled with awe, and they said, we have seen incredible things today. You know... <laughs> There's a lot in these verses. But the main point I want to drive home today is what we sang about earlier. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. Because Jesus, it's really all about you. And I am sorry. I repent. I turn away from the things that I've made it. When I know it's really all about you. It's really all about your presence. It's really all about what Jesus was doing when he would withdraw and he'd go to a deserted place and he'd be there in prayer before the Father. I'm sorry, Lord. Because intimacy with Jesus is the precursor to power with Jesus. And it's the precursor to power in your life. You need intimacy with Jesus to have power in your life. I'm not talking about Tony Robbins' personal power or your favorite guru. And I have nothing against Tony Robbins or any guru. But I'm talking about the power which comes from on high. The power of the Holy Spirit. You need this power in your life. The power that can heal. The power that can change things. Power for your relationships. Power at the office, at work. Power in your ministry, right here in our midst. We don't want to just go up there and be great singers and great musicians and even great talkers. We want the power of the Holy Spirit in us. We want the Spirit to speak. We want the anointing upon us, on our congregations and upon our children. That's what we're here for. But you're not going to have it without intimacy with Christ. Don't kid yourself. Don't be like these guys who are showing up and going through the motions of life. Honestly, I think a lot of them had given up because it had been a long time that they had been waiting. And I think they just decided they were going to create a different Messiah. A Messiah of tradition and of rules. You know, man-made things. And that became their Messiah. So when the real Messiah showed up. Listen, we live in a world today that you hear a lot about disempowerment. People are disempowered by stress. They're disempowered by anxiety. They're disempowered by a lot of things. I wrote a little book called God Help Me, I'm Stressed. Because of this reason. But to have power in life, you need the power of Jesus in your life. You need the power of his Holy Spirit working in you. But these men, their hearts were afar off. And Jesus asked them, why are you thinking this in your hearts? Why are you so off? And my guess is it has something to do with verse 16, that their hearts had truly grown cold. That they had not had sweet intimacy with the Father. They hadn't tasted the fruit of the Spirit. And so how in the world could they ever recognize the Son? And over time, intimacy and fellowship with the Father had hardened into cold, empty traditions that they had invented 
and stories of old, they probably no longer believe. You know those Bible stories about Jonah and Moses and Father Abraham? I think some of these men had a form of that. But in their hearts, it, it was no longer connected to the reality, the pulsing blood in their veins. And friends, it is so easy to go down that path. That's why they rejected the message of John the Baptist. They hadn't prepared their hearts. How could they? You ever tried to plant something in concrete? You ever tried to plant something in your backyard by first laying down a little bit of gravel? Concrete hearts. So we've got to guard our hearts, is what the proverb says. Chapter 4, verse 23. Guard your hearts, it says, because out of it flow all of the issues of life. We've got to guard these hearts, my friends, because out of it flow those issues. And how do we begin to guard our hearts? It is only through intimacy with Christ. We've got to have intimacy with Christ. Yes, we're in the Sun Valley Theater this morning, and it's beautiful. And we have nice chairs, and I love to see the faces of the congregation. And it's wonderful that we're together. And it's awesome that you're here because you could be in a dozen other places. And those watching via the Internet this morning, you could be doing a million other things. But friends, if we have all of this and we don't have our time with the Lord, we've got a big fat zero. We can let this life be about a lot of things. It's easy. We're busy people. There's a lot on the agenda. There's a lot on the fire. But what about the fire in our hearts? John said, prepare your hearts. Prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare our hearts. So, how do we do that? You know, a friend of mine yesterday sent me a text. And um, he was cleaning out a closet or something. There was a whole bunch of books. And he sent me a picture of three books. And he said, remember these? There were three books written by a pastor and a mentor of ours. And those books were like the... Um, the, the food, right, that led us into a love of the book. And he said, remember these? And I wrote him back and I said, yeah, those books changed my life because they fostered in me a love of the scripture and a love of the book. So how are we going to do this, friends? How are we going to have the intimacy with Christ that we want and that he wants so that we can have the power of the Spirit working in our lives, so that we can hear the voice of the Lord and walk in the anointing of the Spirit. How does that all work? Well, we've got to develop the habit of a daily quiet time with the Lord. We've got to make this a priority, friends. I've desired your word, the Bible says, more than my necessary food. We've got to make it like eating food. And so I want to leave you this morning with a few things that you can consider and think about in order to get this into your life. Because it's one thing to stand up here and preach about it and talk about it. It's another thing to do it. And to execute it, right, tomorrow morning or tomorrow evening. So how are we going to get this into our lives? How are we going to practice this? Well, one... I think you've got to be intentional about it. So if this morning you hear the Spirit of the Lord speaking to you, the Bible says, harden not your heart. Open your heart and receive the message because we're all subject to this. We can all be like these Pharisees. 
We can all get away from the word and get away from intimacy with Christ and get into our own strength and into our own flesh. And we can miss what God is trying desperately to do in us and through us. So we've got to get intentional about it. That's the first thing. Schedule it. Put an alarm on it. It could be whatever time works for you. We've heard about the 5 a.m. club. Okay, well, maybe I'm not in the 5 a.m. club. <laughs> maybe I've got a bunch of little kitties running around and things to do in the morning. But, you know, I remember for a stretch in my spiritual growth, I would go during my lunch break. Each of us, if you work, you got 30 minutes, maybe an hour in some cases, and I'd sit out in my car in the parking lot, and I'd have my Bible, and I would just eat my sandwich and read some scriptures and pray and talk to God. That was my quiet time. But whether it's in the morning or it's in the afternoon on your lunch break or in the evening before you go to bed, whatever, you've got to get this into your life. It's not optional. You can make it optional. You're going to end up like this guy who's sitting in the midst of people being healed, raising up their hands, glorifying God, and they're saying, what's wrong with this picture? So you got to get intentional about it. You got to schedule. You got to make sure that this becomes something that you are going to prioritize, like how, you know, if... You decide, you know, on a few days of the week, you're not going to show up at the office. You know what happens. Right? That's not optional. You've got to get this into your life. You've got to select a specific time, preferably when you've got time to focus. Again, some of us are parents. We're even grandparents. We have our kids. Don't schedule at a time where you're distracted. You've got to find some time in the 24 where you can get even 15 minutes where you're not distracted, where Jesus has your full attention. Got to get it. Choose a special place if you can, like a place where you go. You know that's your place. That's your chair or that's your corner. Or in my case, as I said, for that stretch of time, it was in my car. But get a special place. Gather the resources that you're going to need. Your Bible, of course. You're going to get out the book. This morning I brought with me a couple of things that I use. This is my, kind of my study journal, I guess you would call it. Um, in it, I take my notes as I'm reading. And these are at Walmart for about two bucks a piece. I buy them about a half a dozen at a time. And this one, I date it, was started on July 25th of last year. And um, I went through the books of Ezekiel, Luke, and now I'm in Proverbs. So you could put down your thoughts and what God is saying to you in the moment. You see, prayer is a conversation. We talk to God, and he talks to us. We go into a time with God with expectancy. We're looking to hear from God. It's not a rote or a routine transaction. It's a time of connection and fellowship. We want to hear, so God, what are you saying? Jot it down. Not to mention this, on a very practical side of things, once you decide to get this into your life, you start doing it, Satan is going to distract you. You're going to start doing it. He's going to remind you of something that, oh, God, you got to get to today. So I love that. With my journal, oh, I, I need to call this person. Jot it down. Okay, I'm right back with Jesus. Call this out. Oh, make a quick note. Right back with Jesus. It just beats back to distractions, but you get to distill your thoughts. And over the years, I could go back years and look at what God was saying in my life. I hope one day when the Lord takes me home that my grandchildren, I have one grandchild at the moment, but my children and my grandchildren will be able to look and say, hey, this is, how, this is what God was saying to granddad. 
This is how he was feeling. This is how he fought his battles. This is how. So I've got the, the book, but I've got some paper too, so I can jot my thoughts down. And sometimes I work with a commentary. Now, you can get a commentary these days online. You don't need the book like this. Like, uh, you know, I'm an old school person, so I love the books. <laughs> this is Warren Wearsby's commentary on the New Testament, part one. But there are parts in the Bible. Obviously, we're not all um, theologians and scholars. There's parts we don't get when we read it. Like, what is this? Where is it going? But you get your commentary, and your commentary will give you fruit. It will explain things. It will give you the uh, perspective of someone who is a theologian. But the point is, you're going to put in the time and the effort. Because we can't stand here and sing, he is worthy. But then in our actions, we do it differently. When we put in the time and the word... And in hearing from God and being alone with him, setting that crowd aside, setting that time aside, being alone with him. It's saying, it's an act of worship. It's saying you are worthy. My time is the most precious thing that I can give. It is saying to Jesus, you're worthy. And by not giving him that time, it's actually saying the opposite. That maybe there's just more things that are important to me in my life than you are. I want you to consider that. And you begin with an attitude of reverence and an attitude of expectancy. Because as you look up, the Bible says God answers. And so you go in with an attitude of expectancy. God, what are we going to talk about today? What are you going to say to me today? How are you going to challenge me today? It's a walk, a daily walk. And you could follow just a simple plan. You could read for 15 minutes, reflect on what you've read for five minutes. Then, as I said, take out your journal and record what God said to you for another five minutes. There's no formula to any of this. Sometimes you may need to put on some worship music. This morning as we sang the worship, I sat there and I stood up to my feet and I literally had tears running down my face because it touched me so deeply. It moved my heart. Even if my heart was cold, worshiping the Lord in that way, singing those songs, it just melted my heart. Maybe it's a walk in nature. You could go outside and just look in the sky and look at the trees and look at the water and see what the Lord has done. And that brings your heart closer to the Lord. There's no one way of doing this. But we've got to find a way, a way to connect with the way. Amen. Amen. And I'm going to leave you with this and then the praise team can come. And we, we'll have a time of prayer, maybe a time that we can rededicate ourselves to that intimacy with Christ. And maybe there's someone here who you got invited, or maybe you're watching and you just happen to land on this YouTube channel. But you've never really given your heart to the Lord, you know? You've kind of attended church or you've heard some things or... Someone told you about Jesus, or maybe someone in your family is a believer, or maybe you've been looking and you've been praying, you've been seeking. It's like the Holy Spirit is knocking on your heart, but you haven't said yes. And maybe this is the day on March 12, 2023, in the Sun Valley Theaters, right here, you would say, yes, Jesus, come in my heart. And show me how to live this way. Melt my heart. Break up the hard ground. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your power to live. 
Maybe you would say that today. Maybe today would be your day. But the last thing I'm going to leave you with on this message is don't ever quit. Listen, it's hard standing up here and preaching a message like this to you. I'm just going to tell you the truth. Because anytime I stand in front of a group of my brothers and sisters like this, and I preach a message like this, it's almost like I feel the immediate blowback. Oh, yeah, there's Wayne Gill, Mr. Jesus. He's got his little commentary and his, his Bible and his, his little nerd journal. But normal people aren't like that. And I just want to say to you that, no, that's not true. That we all struggle with this. We do. I'm not here to impose some kind of standard on you. Not at all. It's, it's hard. But can I tell you, friends, he is so worthy. He is so worthy of your time and of your attention. And when we spell love, we don't spell it L-O-V-E, friends. We spell it T-I-M-E. We show him our love for him, our devotion to him, by our willingness to be alone with him, to give him that time like Jesus went alone. Often he withdrew himself to deserted places and he prayed. Aid. We've got to have that, friends. We've got to reclaim it. If, 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 if it's out of our lives, we've got to get it back. No shame, no judgment. We're in this together. We're the body. I want you to take this this morning as an encouragement to you. Let us be lifted and encouraged to find our way back if we've drifted. We've all drifted from time to time. That's what happened with these teachers of the law. Now, the Bible does say in the New Testament that there were Pharisees who came to Christ. Right? There were some of those teachers who did allow the Spirit to break up that heart, that ground, so that the Word could be implanted and that they can have that intimacy with Christ and with the Spirit of God. So it wasn't like every Pharisee and every teacher sat there and fought Christ. Hey, the word is alive. It's active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It heals. It restores. It brings you back. If you're far off, you, it, it will restore you. Restoration is here. The spirit of the living God is here. He is in our presence right now, right here in Sun Valley. He is here. So let's invite him. Whether you don't know him, this might be your time to know him. Or if he's been far, or if you've been far, or you feel afar. Oh man, it's time to come back. Come back to the heart of worship. I'm going to ask if some of our elders and prayer partners would come to the front. I want to close this out in a word of prayer. And I want to issue the invitation that if that's you. And you need prayer this morning to come back to the heart of worship. Or to come to Jesus himself for the first time to give your heart to him. This is your time. Let me pray for you, and then we're going to have the, the worship team lead us. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this time. Thank you for your people, Lord. God, you've poured out your spirit upon us, Lord. And you've called us into fellowship with you. Holy Spirit of God, open up our hearts that we would hear from you. That, Lord, we would move not in our own thoughts and in our own ideas, but in the power of your Holy Spirit. Pour out yourself on this congregation right now as we worship you. 
as we pray, as we seek you now. God, we love you and we thank you. And we say these things in Jesus' name. So you come. If you need prayer, you come. The altar's open. The Holy Spirit is here. He wants to heal you. He wants to touch you. He wants to work in your life. You come. You don't let anything stop you. You come. You come. If you need Jesus, you come. You make him your savior this morning. No more guesswork. No more second guessing yourself. No more delay. Just say, Lord Jesus, here I am. I don't know how this works, but I'm here. I know I'm going to trust that you will show me and you will teach me. You will lead me. You come on down. Interesting as Wayne is uh, talking, I know we have a lot of families in here, and uh, it's one of the funny things when we're with other families, um, and one of our kids cries, the parent knows exactly, right, that's my kid, yeah, and maybe you have little kids, I remember when me and Kristen had little babies, we would think that they were crying, especially like when you try to take a shower and they were taking a nap, and you're like, no, I hear them screaming, you run up and they're still passed out, and maybe you don't have kids, but... Uh, you were a kid once and you knew your mom's voice <laughs> when you were doing something. And uh, I was just thinking about, as Wayne was talking, of um, not just writing stuff out and reading, but listening, uh, that many of us are doing that and to not be surprised when God speaks mm. at different times. Um, there's a um, reality that God has been speaking the whole time. And, and what I've experienced in my own practice, I'm not perfect in my daily devotional, but I pursue it. I make it intentional. I have my resources. <laughs> I follow Wayne's outline, right? Uh, last night we were having dinner and a friend we were sitting with said a word and I was like, hold on. I took out my phone. My wife's like, you're being rude. You shouldn't have your phone out. And I go, I have to write this down because I don't have my journal with me, but I feel like God wants to say something through that little comment. And I would say this, friends, I know so many of you are pursuing Christ and that quiet time is a time where you are open, but he also is speaking like when you're driving, he's speaking through friends. I remember we were praying last Sunday morning and I felt like he was saying something to me specifically in that. And especially we're in the season of Lent, a lot of y'all are fasting or abstaining from things and doing these different rhythms, like to be open. We serve and worship a God who is alive and is acting and is speaking even this morning. Maybe you showed up not expecting anything and he's been shouting at you. <laughs> uh, would you respond to that right now? Respond in the moment. Open yourself up to him.